Good morning. Last time in the lecture, we saw how to use the force method to solve a truss uh, analysis problem. Uh, just to quickly review uh, that process, if you uh, look at what we uh, looked at, this was the truss example that we looked at and uh, <clears throat> it was a four panel truss. This was the loading and uh, we calculated the forces in the members due to the loading. Uh, for that, we took x1 and x2 as the two uh, redundants and then uh, we went ahead and uh, found out uh, the forces in the base structure that is without these two both being zero. We found out all the forces in all the members. Then we applied x1 equal to 1 and x2 equal to 0 found out the forces. Applied x2 equal to 1 x1 equal to 0 and found out the forces. And uh, after that, <coughs> we put all of those values that we computed in one uh, table and then from there, from the table, we computed all these various parameters and ultimately, these were the two equations that we got and we solved for x1 and x2 and once you solve for x1 and x2, then you know what the uh, values are in those parameters and you can find out all the forces. Today, what we are going to be doing is we are going to be looking at the second part of the problem which we did not solve, which was forces in members due to the temperature only, where A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E are subjected to an elevated temperature of 25 degrees where alpha is 1.2 into 10 to the power of minus 5. So, today we are going to be looking at how to do uh, this particular problem. Okay. Note that this remains as our x 1 equal to 1 and x 2 equal to 1. These are still our virtual force and real force systems depending on how you are going to be using them. I have already talked about them last time. I am not going to repeat that. So, now the only thing that happens differently is that only change that happens is that these equations, if you look at this, and there is also another uh, equation here which I did not write it down that day that is 1 upon E A P I P 2 I L I. Note that this term is just replaced by what is this term? This term if you look at it is nothing but the deformation, real deformation in I member because of the loading. Okay? Now, in the case where we have uh, the temperature problem, in the temperature problem, all that happens is you calculate the deformation in the member directly. You calculate the deformation in the member directly. So, you do not calculate forces, you calculate the deformation directly and your problem statement becomes this way, delta 1 0 is equal to summation over all the members delta i into p 1 i and delta 2 0 is equal to i delta i p 2 i. These come from your virtual force equations. I do not want to go into that all over again. This is the only difference. The computing of F11, F22, F12 and F21, which I uh, looked at last time, which are essentially, if you look at it, these remain the same. Only this and this for loading is this and when you have temperature, this is different and this is given by these, where these are 
the temperature deformations that you get in every member. Okay, so let us look at it. We have only member AB, member BC, member CD, and member DE. These are the only members that are subjected to the elevated temperature. So let us find out delta of AB due to the elevated temperature. How will we find that out? Alpha. So alpha is 1.2 into 10 to the power of minus 5 into delta T. Delta T is 25 degrees into L. What is L A B? L A B is equal to 5 root 2. Okay. So if you look at this, what does this become? This becomes 1 point into 2.5 is 30, 30 into 5 is 150. So this becomes 1.5 root 2 into 10 to the power of minus 3 meters. Okay. So then similarly delta BC if you look at it is 1.2 into 10 to the power of minus 5 into 25 into its length which is 5. So this is equal to 1.5 into 10 to the power of minus 3 meters. Delta CD similarly will turn out to be 1.5 into 10 to the power of me and delta DE will turn out to be 1.5 into 10 to the power of minus 3 meters. So we have computed these. Now these are the only ones. So here all that will happen is delta 1 0 will only have delta AB into the P1 of AB and P1 of AB we have <coughs> P1 of AB is 0. Okay. Then we have delta BC which is 1.5 into P1 BC. Then delta CD into P1 AC and delta DE is equal is into this. So if you look at it, if you look at the entire uh, procedure, since P1 AB, P1 CD and P1 DE are all 0, the only thing that contributes is BC and so delta 1 0 will turn out to be equal to 1.5 root 2 into 10 to the power of minus 3 multiplied by 1 by root 2 minus because it is minus 1 over root 2. So delta 1 basically becomes minus 1.5 into 10 to the power of minus 3 meters which is my 1.5 millimeter. Okay. Similarly, we can compute and here again for P2I you will see that only CD comes in and CD has exactly the same uh, concept and therefore if you look at it that you will see, uh, <coughs> sorry I have made a mistake here, uh, uh, delta BC uh, is not 1.5 it is, so you basically have 1.5 over root 2, so 1.5 over root 2, that is approximately about a millimeter. Similarly, delta 2 0 also turns out to be exactly the same by computing in that case CD, so it will be 1.5 into 10 to the power of minus 3 multiplied by minus 1 over root 2, it becomes minus 1 over half. So essentially, once we have computed delta 1 0 and delta 2 0, we substitute the same equations that you have which is delta 1 0 plus F 1 1 X 1 plus F 1 2 X 2 is equal to 0, delta 2 0 plus F 2 1 X 1 plus F 2 2 X 2 is equal to 0. And since we know these, 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 these and these, we can solve for X 1 and X 2 and the value of X 1 and X 2 turn out to be equal to
plus 17.6 and so is x2. Seventeen point six kilonewtons, and once you know uh, this thing uh, in, uh, and then the force in the member is going to be equal to P. Now, in this case, what is P? P is the load due to the uh, temperature alone. So, temperature alone, this is zero. So, you're going to have P one. I that is the force in the member into x1 plus p2i into x2. So, this becomes the force in all the members due to temperature where p1i and p2i are already we have got these are p1i and p2i okay, p1i and p2i and you know x1 and x2 and you can obtain the forces. So, this in a sense is your uh, the forces that you find out in your um, truss for temperature. Okay? So, now we want what we want to do is we want to go ahead and look at a frame problem. We have already looked at how to tackle a realistic truss problem and today what I am going to be doing is I am going to be looking at uh, how to treat a frame problem and I will take an actual problem and go through all the numbers so that at the end of it all it helps you to be able to uh, uh, get uh, solve a, a frame problem too. So, let us take a frame and <coughs> I am going to take a simple frame. See, essentially, if you understand the concepts uh, with a, a, a simple frame, you should be able to use it to solve any problem. So, I am going to just, but I will go through all the details so that you know how to tackle the problem. Okay? So, let us take a situation where we have this is 5 meters, this is 5 meters and uh, let me call this A, B, C and D. And these are the loads on the structure. This is acting at the center span. So, it is like 2.5 meters and this is acting at uh, B, a lateral load. This is a typical kind of load you would have, a gravity load and a lateral load due to wind um, or maybe even earthquake, it does not matter. So, this is the load and uh, this we have to draw the bending moment diagram for this particular structure. Remember, I am going to explicitly state it that we only consider flexion. In other words, both axial and shear deformations are neglected. Okay? So, this is the uh, problem. How many degrees of static indeterminacy? I will leave it up to you to go through your steps using my procedure. You will see that the static indeterminacy is 1 and I am going to take this reaction as my x 1. Okay? So, this is the problem statement. So, now I need to go, uh, what is the first step? The first step is find out the, uh, take the base structure where x 1 is equal to 0, find out all the forces uh, in the member and find out the deformations and then put x 1 equal to 1 and find out the bending moment diagram and once you get the bending moment diagram, you can then well, go through the process. Okay, let's go, let's go through uh, this particular process. So the first part is where x one is equal to zero. 
Okay, let me put it explicitly x1 equal to 0 and this is the loading this is 10 10 so what will be the reactions at this point reaction over here will be 10 reaction horizontal reaction will be 10 and you will see that this gives rise look this is 5 meters and this is 2.5 meters 2.5 meters so if you look at this 5 into 10 if I take moments about this point 5 into 10 plus uh, 2.5 into 10 and that is the net uh, moment that has to be resisted here so you have a resisting moment here equal to 75 and once you have that you can draw the bending moment diagram let's see how I'll draw the bending moment diagram the bending moment diagram over here would land up being starting from C okay the value over here would be 25 and then that would be the same value here okay and then this becomes 75 the sense of the bending is this way and the sense of the bending over here is this way okay this is your bending moment diagram M diagram. This is M diagram for x1 equal to 0. So, this is the base structure bending moment diagram. Okay. Note that I have also made the assumption that this EI and this EI are the same. So, actually if I just divide by EI and EI that would give me, me my m by e i diagram. What is then this? What is the m by e i? This is the curvature. So, it directly gives the curvature diagram for the real curvatures under the loads. Okay. What is the next step? Next step is for x 1 equal to 1. So, let us find out what the reactions at this point are. The reaction at this point is going to be 1. The, this is going to be 0 and what else was the moment going to be equal to see this is 5 and this is 5 so if you look at it take moments about this point this gives rise to this so you're going to have a moment in this direction which is equal to 5 well I'm not going to write kilonewtons because this is just unit there's no force so this is the moment 5 okay and how will the bending moment diagram look note I don't care which direction I draw the diagram as long as I show the sense. I am drawing it in the same direction as that, but note that here the bending is hogging. In other words, tension at the bottom, compression at the top. Here it is sagging, so it is going to be tension at the top and sorry, just the opposite. Uh, this is sagging because tension at the bottom so it's going to be sagging okay and this is going to be hogging so although I've drawn it on the same side you can draw it on the other side I don't uh, you know it doesn't really matter you can draw it however you have been asked to draw so I think you know as long as you're consistent this is the point that I always make that as long as you're consistent it does not matter and this value is equal to 5 and you will see that at this point it is going to give rise to a sagging moment we have to it is actually this way and that is correct that if you look at this you will get it over here here it is actually uh, the, the opposite way here if you look at this this is this way this way and this way. This is the opposite way. Okay, I am so sorry, made a mistake here. Please ensure that you understand. This is hogging. This is hogging because this creates a curvature in this direction, and that is what you are doing here. And this also is this way. Okay, so and uh, over here. Uh, you have it as sagging.
this is sagging okay so what what do we have let me just uh, you know put it together in another one uh, i'll draw it small so that i have both of them uh, the actual m by e i diagram is starting from c this is hogging hogging 25 75 these are kilonewton meter because the loading is kilonewton and the forces are so these are 25 by ei and 75 by ei note that if you have two different eis then the moment diagram and the m by i diagram would not be the same but in this case i have taken them to be the same and this is the small m1 diagram the m1 diagram is i've shown it on the same side but this one is the sense is opposite okay so this is the m by e i diagram this is the m1 diagram now what do we do well we already seen that note that if i want to find out the displacement at this point then my equation becomes delta 1 0 is equal to integral over the whole length m1 into m upon e i dx over the entire length of the frame okay so that is delta 1 0 so if we take this if you look at this particular uh, situation then all you have to do is take this area and at its centroid find out this value take this area and the centroid find out this value so if we do that i'll go through the steps right so let us look at it what will you get over here this particular one what is the area under the curve 25 upon ei multiplied by 2.5 by 2 that's the area under this curve multiplied by now let us look at this which point would this be this point would be 2.5 uh, by 3 from this end which is actually 5 by 6 so so if you look at this since this is 5 okay this is 5 by 6 from this point so if you take that you will see that the value this the value at that particular point the centroid of this graph is going to be equal to 25 by 6 is going to be the value at that particular point is that clear so it's going to be equal to 25 upon ei multiplied by 2.5 by 2 this is the area of this curve multiplied by 25.6 which is the value at the centroid of this this is the integral of this area okay the integration over this length then we look at it over this length this can be broken up into two parts one a rectangle rectangle of 25 by ei so you're going to have plus 25 upon ei into 5 that is the area under this curve multiplied by the value at that's going to be 5 because this is a constant it doesn't matter where the centroid is it's going to be the same and the next one is going to be the difference which is 50 upon ei so 50 upon ei multiplied by 5 divided by 2 this is the area of this triangle multiplied by 5 which is the 
centroid at that point. If we look at all of this, <coughs> what we get is 1, 3, 8, 0 upon 2 Ei. So this is delta 1, 0. This is the value of delta 1, 0 and then we need to find out the deflection due to x1 equal to 1. What is the deflection due to x1 equal to 1? That is my f11, that is my flexibility. Displacement at 1 due to unit load at 1 and that is equal to m1 squared upon ei dx. Okay. If you look at this, this is what is the uh, flexibility? Flexibility is displacement at 1 due to x1 equal to 1. So, what is going to be the actual displacement due to x1? It is going to be f11 into x1. I am introducing the concept of flexibility which I have introduced with the truss. I am doing the same thing over here. So, if you look at this, uh, if I uh, draw this and th this will then be this integral with itself upon E i. Okay. So, if you look at this, this is going to be equal to 5 into 5 by 2, that is the area under the curve multiplied by 10 by 3, that is the value at the centroid. <coughs> okay. Then plus 5, sorry this is going to be 5 upon E i because this is the real part and then 5 uh, upon E i multiplied by 5 multiplied by 5. What are these? This is the integral of m1 square dx over this length and this part is the integral over this length. <coughs> okay. So, if we look at this, this is going to be equal to Five hundred by three e i. Okay, and uh, so this is my f one one, and so what is my compatibility condition? Delta one zero plus f one one x one is equal to zero. Since there's only one redundant, this is the only additional equation that I require, and from this, by plugging in the value of delta one zero and f11 I get x1 is equal to minus no, I'm sorry I, I have made a mistake uh, I just wanted to make a point here that since this and these are opposite the delta 1 0 turns out to be negative 1382 so here x1 equals to 8.2 8 kilonewton. So, I have got the value of the reaction at the support D that we have. Now, once I have got that, what is the next step? The next step here is to actually draw the bending moment diagram. However, before drawing the bending moment diagram, let me draw the this is my loading. Now, I know this value, right? this reaction. So, this is A, this is B, this is C and D. I found out this reaction and this reaction value is 8.28 kilo Newtons. Now, once I know this, I can actually find out the reactions at this point. This reaction is going to be 1.72 kilonewtons. This is going to remain 10 kilonewtons and what I get is that if I, if I find out that the moment over here is 10 into 5 plus 2.5 into 10 that is 75 minus 8.28 into 5. So, this is going to give me a moment in this direction whose value is going to be equal to 
six zero kilonewton meter. So once I have found out the reactions, I can proceed to finding out the uh, the forces uh, in the, uh, the bending moment diagram. Let me just see how how will I draw the bending moment diagram. Let me go piece by piece. Let me go in this particular case. So I will take B C D, I will separate out B C D and A B separately. So if I do separate out, then what are the things that I generate? If I take out B C D, okay, this is 8.28, this is 10. Note that I am going to isolate the joint and then I am going to have the member. So, this is A, B, C and D. The only difference is this cut that I have made is actually infinitesimally small. It is just so that I can isolate the joint B and look at it separately. So now this one, when I make a cut here, what are the forces that I generate over here? The forces that I generate over here are a shear. Okay, so the shear, shear is going to be in this direction. Then a moment. Okay, the moment. Uh, let us just take positive moment right now. So the positive moment will be in this direction. And what else? There could be an axial force too. Note that you do not have to consider shear deformations and actual deformations, but the forces are still going to be there. So, this is going to be M, this is going to be V, this is going to be P and can I find out these values? Sure, because I have this. Here I know this is roller supports so a moment is going to be equal to 0. So, what is V going to be equal to in this particular case? V is going to be equal to 1.5. 72 because you take sigma fy you will see that it's equal to 1.72 kilonewtons what's the moment over here well let's see let's take moment about this point this is going to give you 10 into 2.5 this way and this is going to give you 8.28 into 5 the other way so this is going to give you 41.4 minus 25 what is that going to be equal to it's going to be equal to 16. Point for which direction? If it, it's going to be actually, if you look at it, this is going to be this way. This is going to be this way. So the net moment is actually going to be. If I'm showing this way, it's going to be minus sixteen point four kilonewton. What can we say about p? Take a sigma f x equal to zero. You'll see it's zero kilonewtons. So I found out the forces here. Once I find out the forces here, just the opposite ones are going to be coming here. Now, let me take this one. This one, I know all the reactions that are coming here. 1.72, this is going to be 10 and we have already found this out, right? So, this is 33.60 kilonewton meter. Okay? And uh, if you look at this particular case, so how do I find out the Mm, uh, for, so, when I make a cut here, I am going to get a reaction V here, I am going to get a moment here and I am going to get an axial force P here. So, let me just see this is, I will make them separate so that the P prime. So, what will be P prime equal to sigma F y equal to 0 gives me that P prime is equal to 1.72 kilonewton meter. What is V prime uh, going to be equal to? If you look at this, sigma F x equal to 0 will give me 10 kilonewton meter. And what is M prime going to be equal to? Let us see. 10 into 50 is going to be in this way. Okay, 33 is in this way. So, what is it going to be equal to? If you look at this, this is going to be giving this way. Okay, so if you look at your moment, it's going to uh, remain. Uh, this moment is going to be equal to 
50 minus 33. So, that is going to be 16 point. So, let us look at this, review this again. Taking moments about this point, what do we generate? We generate that this moment plus this moment is equal to this moment. So, let us see m is m plus 10 into 2.5 uh, minus 8.28 into 5 is equal to 0. That is sigma m equal to 0. If you take that, you will see that this is going to be plus 16.4. Okay? And this is the, if you take v plus v plus 8.25 minus 10 is equal to 0. So, v is going to be equal to this and sigma f x equal to 0 is going to give me p equal to 0 here. In this particular case, what do you get? If you take sigma f y equal to 0, you will get p plus sorry p minus 1.72 is equal to 0. So, you get p v prime. You get v prime minus 10 is equal to 0. So, you get v prime and similarly moment <coughs> plus 33.60 minus 10 into 5 is going to be equal to 0. So, moment is going to be equal to this. Okay. So, I have found out the at the ends of the two uh, members. So, now and similarly I can actually find out the forces uh, at the joints also. Let us look at that. Okay. So, I am going to look, I am going to spend some time looking at equilibrium here because after this I am not going to be looking at equilibrium. So, now, I have already done this. So, I am just going to put them down. Eight point two eight kilo Newton here, one point seven two kilo Newton load ten kilo Newton moment over here is 16.4 kilonewton meter. What else? Over here I have 1.72 kilonewtons. This is going to be 10 kilonewtons. Moment over here is 33.6 kilonewton meter. At this point I have 10, I have 1.72 and I have moment equal to 16.4 kilonewton meter. So, now let us do it on this side. So, this side is going to give rise to this force which is going to be equal to 1.72 is going to give rise to a moment here. Okay? So, and here I have the 10 kilonewton force and then over here I am going to have 1.72 this is going to be in this direction 10 and the bending moment is going to be in this direction. So, let us look at the joint now. Let us look at the equilibrium of the joint. Let me take of equilibrium of the joint sigma f x equal to 0. I have minus 10 here. So, I will put it minus 10. I have plus 10 here plus 10. That is it. There is no other force here. So, this is equal to 0 automatically satisfied. Then we look at sigma f y equal to 0. Sigma f y equal to 0 is going to give me that this is upwards 1.72. There is no load over here and over here it is downwards 1.72. So, it is 0. Check and then take me, let me take moment equal to 0. Let me take moments about this point. Since these distances are 0, these do not give rise to any moments. So, what is the moment? I have a clockwise moment here and anti-clockwise moment. The clockwise moment is 16.4. The anti-clockwise moment is 16.4. So, check. So, that means all that I have done is correct. And so, now once I have this particular uh, loading done, now the next thing that I am going to be doing is I am going to be actually putting together the uh, bending moment diagram. Okay. So, now since I know all of those how will the bending moment diagram look? This side remains the same. It is going to be 16.4. 
33.6. So, A B there is no mistake, it is 33.6 and this is 16.4, this is also 16.4, okay, this is this way and let us see uh, what we have. You see, let us see what the moment at this point is going to be. Moment at this point, if I take, take a cut, take a cut here. So, I am taking a cut exactly to the left of this load. What is going to be the moment? This is going to be 16.4 and this. So, take moment about this point, it is going to be 16.4 plus 1.72 into 2.5. So, that is going to be equal to 0.5. So, this is going to go this way. So, this if you look at it is going to be equal to uh, 20. Uh, this is going to be 41.6, so it is going to be 20.8. So, this value is going to be 20.8, this is going to be 16.4, all of them are in kilonewton meter. So, this is the bending moment diagram for the actual structure where I have included both the effect of the uh, actual loads as well as the redundant force. So, this in essence is my force method solution. I hope that with this kind of procedure and I have gone through a detailed frame analysis problem, so that you know exactly how the force method is used to solve a frame problem. Till now, I have always been talking about the basics. So, this time I have gone through all the details, so that you can actually feel comfortable using the force method for solving a frame problem. Okay? So, now just to refresh your memory, up till now all that I had done was going to be a review. You have already hopefully used the force method etcetera uh, for solving both truss as well as beam and frame problems. Okay? So, let me just go back and say in essence what the force method entails. This is irrespective of whether you have a truss or beam frame. In a beam frame, the only thing that happens in a frame, if you notice, the only difference between a beam and a frame that I pointed out that day was that in a frame, all that happens is what is shear over here becomes actual force over here and uh, whatever is shear uh, over here may become actual force here. It would have if this had not been there. So, the point that the only difference between a beam and a frame is that in a beam, if you have multi span beams, a shear in one beam will always be a shear in another beam, an actual force in one beam would be an actual force in another beam. But in a frame, a beam and a column, okay, the forces, the shear forces in the beam may land up giving actual forces in the column and the shear forces in the uh, column may land up being actual force in the beam. That is all that is there. Otherwise, equilibrium and all the forces that you develop are identical whether you have a beam or a frame. Okay? So, that is the reason why I have the equilibrium considerations may be different in a beam and a frame, but as far as the solution is concerned, there is no difference between a beam and a frame. And you only consider flexure and in a truss you only consider axial. Okay? So, what does the force method entail? The force method entails one find 
static indeterminacy. This is fundamental to using the force method. If by now you do not have confidence in obtaining the static indeterminacy of structure, there is no way you are going to be using able to use the force method. So, please given any structure you should be able to find out the static indeterminacy of the structure. I have spent the first two lectures looking at how to uh, determine the static indeterminacy for a truss as well as a beam frame structure. So, by now you should be able to get the static indeterminacy. If you can't please go back look at enough problems look at any book on structural analysis take up some problems essentially uh, uh, st structural analysis of statically indeterminate structures take up any structure and find out the static indeterminacy if you can if you are confident that you found out the static indeterminacy properly you can use the force method easily so find the f static indeterminacy once you find the static indeterminacy you identify the redundant forces. What are the redundant forces? Those are the forces on the structure. They could be a support reaction, they could be internal forces. If you looked at the frame problem that we looked at, we took the support to be a redundant force. If you looked at the truss problem that we solved, we took internal uh, for uh, members forces to be redundant forces. It is not uh, you know the only thing is that the redundant forces have to be such that if they were 0 the structure would still remain stable that is most important. You, you cannot take out uh, redundant uh, forces put something equal to 0 which will make the structure unstable that cannot be done. Okay? So, ensure that it does not matter if you have static indeterminacy in support reactions you can remove some support reactions and take them as redundance. Okay? If you do not have uh, redundance for example, if you looked at the truss structure that I had, I had a hinge at one end and a roller at one end. I cannot remove a support reaction without making the structure unstable. So, therefore, in that particular case I had to take redundant forces which were internal. Okay? In the frame case that I considered, I could remove the roller support and still have a stable uh, structure and so therefore, I remove the cable support. Is that clear? So, this is overall the concept that you remove the redundant forces such that you get, uh, you identify redundant forces such that you get a stable statically determinate base structure by taking redundant forces equal to 0. Okay? Second, what you do is you uh, find the member deformations under loading. So, how do you find out member deformations? The way you find out the def member deformations if you have a loading is that you find out the loads uh, if member forces due to by solving uh, the statically determinate problem and you find out the member forces and based on that once you know the member forces for example, if it is axial uh, force if it is a truss member it is axial force the axial deformation is given by P L upon E A that is the axial deformation. If you uh, look at uh, flexor, then the uh, act, uh, flexural deformation is given by M upon E i. So, these are the member deformations that you find out under the loading. If it is uh, a temperature loading or a lack of fit, then you know the member deformation directly. Okay? So, that is the overall. Third, find member forces due to unit redundant forces. So, if you have two redundants, you will apply 
one redundant first and put the other redundant equal to 0. So, you put x 1 equal to 1 and x 2 equal to 0 and then you create another find out another member forces finding out uh, putting x 1 equal to 0 and x 2 equal to 1. Okay? So, find the member forces this helps you to essentially use find deflections corresponding to redundant forces using virtual work. So, once you find the deflections this we have already done then the next step is the 5 is compatibility conditions apply apply compatibility conditions and from that solve for the redundant forces and 7 knowing redundant forces find internal forces and support this is your structural Okay. So, I have essentially laid out the procedure for using the force method. I hope at the end of this lecture you are confident in using the force method to solve any truss or beam frame problem. Next time onwards I am going to start with looking at the matrix approach to the force method. In this way I am going to be introducing you to the matrix methods that are actually used in structural analysis of real structures. Thank you.